And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother here, here in the temple. You may have previously known him as the as the madman behind Paranoia, or not Paranoia, Pandora. I don't know why I said it like that. I.e., the superhero game where everything gets wrecked. But for this, we wanted to, we wanted to delve into a previous affair, affair of his, the the cooperative storytelling game known as Screenplay and it and its associated campaign settings. The one and only, the man known as the Warden. But also known as Todd Crapper. Hello, doing? hello, hello, everybody. How you doing today, man? Good, good, good. How's it going with you? It's going good. Mother Nature is um, freebasing again, so I guess she's, <laughs> I guess she's she's ha she's hanging out with Hunter S. Thompson. So I'm so I'm guessing I'm going to be waking up in the middle of the night going, "We can't stop here. This is back country." Um, but. But overall, I'm overall I'm glad to be out of the um, summer heat. Yes, as a Canadian, I'm aware that there is this thing called summer heat. Um, we just know that as a snow-free zone. Mm -hmm. Well, um, remember, I'm I'm in Minnesota. I'm not far. I may as well be in Canada South. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's right. You are honorary Canadians. In fact, I think we have uh, legislation that's passed. That in the event of any kind of you know natural catastrophe or something like that, you guys instantly get refugee status uh, with us up here in Canada because <laughs> we, we know it's basically just you're not going to be able to see the border under all that snow anyway. So you might as well just come on up and hole up with us. Well, I end up I end up I end up sneaking close to the border anyways when it comes to fishing season. So ah, uh, so there we extra, go. Extra steps. It's called. Called the Boundary Waters. Plus, um, there's a there's a spot way up north called International Falls where where it all where it always gets the coldest, but barely anybody goes up there, especially given mm. how close it is to the lake. Um, oh, okay. I should probably I should probably clarify Lake Superior because I'm in Minnesota. <laughs> it's a case of which fucking lake. <laughs> so. In in um saner matters that do not involve me getting assaulted by geese for the umpteenth time. Um, how did how did um screenplay come about? Um, it was actually uh, the result of uh, me trying to take um uh, the wrong game and force it to do the absolute uh, opposite of what it was built to do. <laughs> <laughs> so um it had actually started uh, uh about oh maybe about three or four years earlier i had made um like a, a professional assassin rpg called kill shot mm -hmm. and it was the first original system that i had designed and so i think with like most people once they built their first system from scratch i had the mentality that it was the be all end all of all gaming systems and it could handle everything for every single situation whatsoever watch i'll prove it guys let's come up with a campaign setting and then we'll use the rules for kill shot to run it with um what we ended up coming up with was the basis for what became high plane samurai um and it did not take long for me to realize that no 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 there was absolutely no way that the mechanics for kill shot were gonna handle um, a game basically about gunslinger samurai, um, you know, in a wushu world full of, you know, gangsters in a post-apocalyptic setting. Uh, no, that wasn't the case. So it was basically this, it was my uh, first crack at what was basically a story game. The idea of things where there is a shared narrative space, what's basically known as a writer's table. Um, when I started to realize, you know, like my approach to how I was looking at gaming was very much in the whole roll dice to determine pass fail. Um, you know, the only effect is damage and, and everything else like this. It was my first real true crack at making something that was a shared narrative game 
um, that was actually supposed to be far more open and interpretive to numerous genres and everything. Like I thought I had done the first time with Killshot. So that's how that came about. Yeah. <clears throat> now, I've seen I've seen the I've seen people um, di- dive back and forth about whether about whether or not screenplay is a story game or a role playing game. Um, where where do you where do you think it fits into that paradigm? I think it's like asking if uh, a book is a a, a novel or a book. Um, I think it's basically just you know it's just kind of playing with semantics, so to speak. I I personally find story games and role playing games to lean very close to each other to the point that I almost don't see too much point in you know getting kind of nitpicky about it. For me, it's more so about how they work to accomplish what it is that they want to do. Um, you know, the case can be made that story games, you know, have a much bigger focus on, you know, quote unquote, the story. But once again, it really depends on who you speak to individually. So I, I'll use the term story game as a shorthand for those people whose ears perk up when they hear those kinds of things. And there are some people where, you know, that term can also... Um, you know, can have its own biases of, oh, I tried one of those words before and it was, it was weird. It wasn't in my comfort zone or anything like that. But I mean, if there were some common traits that I've seen, you know, um, in other games that identify as story games, I would say one of the main things is that there, uh, there's a big emphasis on uh, sharing the narrative load in the sense where it isn't all just up to one person typically the GM, to actually create uh, and do things. Um, There's a lot more invitation for everyone at the table to contribute something to the world, to the plot, to the characters, even if it's not their own characters, Um, and that the mechanics of the game basically kind of help you make choices of, you know, the, the kind of direction that it's going to go into. So rather than it's just like, I'm going to see if I pick the lock on the door, Mm -hmm. you know, story games might be more inclined to say, it's like, yeah, 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 we got that. You can pick the lock. The question is, are you going to be able to pick the lock before the guard comes around the door? Or, you know, like, is it going to set off some kind of an alarm or, or some kind of thing like that? Powered by the apocalypse, PBTA games probably being the most, uh, well known within the industry. I I'd say that maybe probably the most defining aspects of it. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the set when it comes to the um, the set the setup, you me- you mentioned you mentioned taking the you mentioned taking the wrong game and trying to ham and trying to hammer it out. Um, what did you mean by that? Well, kill shot. Uh, the system behind that is called the optional system, mm-hmm. and with that one, it's a dice pool game where you will collect a whole bunch of different types of dice from d20s all the way down to d4s and roll them all together add them up and then determine the you know result from there um right off the bat the main problem came down to a matter of speed of play so in the case of kill shot the idea is that it is possible to you know pull the trigger once and take somebody out in one fell swoop um, and so it would it made more sense for kill shot to play it that way, whereas something where it was supposed to be far more fast paced action, um, it would take you know longer than I preferred for the turns to be over. You know, so it's one of those things where not all games are able to accomplish all things. I think a better way of putting it is not all games are able to accomplish the acquired goal for everybody so for some people you know how fast the game plays out at the table is not a factor for some it's simply about you know what is the end result and if the game helps them take it you know their story in a certain direction that they really like um that they're they don't think maybe they would have come up with on their own cool mission accomplished but you know, if the majority of people are like, well, yeah, that worked, but it was also clunky. I kept having to look at the rules to reference stuff. 
you know, if the style of play that it provides doesn't really match up with what the majority of people who play it are, are, are looking for, then it's not really compatible. It's not doing the trick. Mm-hmm. It's like asking someone who specializes in uh, directing operas um, to, you know, film a documentary, uh, you know, uh, that doesn't use any sound whatsoever. Um, you're you're possibly asking the wrong person to do the wrong job. Mm-hmm. You know, so that that's really the main thing with that. It's just not everything out there is made to do every single task, and that's one of the. You know, just like with anything else, sometimes you have to learn the hard way by actually trying and then realizing, oh. I'm supposed to do that. That 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 doesn't work this way. Let's try something else. I can, I can certainly get that. Um, and with that with that kind of thing in mind, because um, I've because I've had I've had this discussion in the past when it came to when it came, when it came, when it came to adapting cer- adapting certain stories, IPs, or what have you into tabletop. Um, are you familiar at all with the concept of system does matter? Yes. Oh, what? It the reason why I bring that that up is um it instantly came to mind when you talk, when you talked about jamming a essentially jamming a square peg into a round hole. Regard regarding use regarding using something that's going to fit. Um. And to to that en- to that end, um. When shifting between kill shot and Killshot's option system and screenplay. Um, what were some of the bigger things you can think of that were a case of this is not going to transfer? I need to blow this up. I think the main thing was that um, so because we were using it to try and run High Plane Samurai, and that one is literally the whole premise of that setting was we just kept throwing things on the wall and you know. And forcing everything to stick, um, and in that particular case, it was a matter of, you know, I needed to have a space where the game could handle not only handle everybody creating something and adding different elements to the game, but that could also, you know, help regulate it and maintain it, incentivize it, you know what I started to realize that what I wanted was instead of a game that determined, you know, if the outcome of your effort was successful, what I wanted was something that could basically take anything that comes out of a a player's mouth on their turn and allow them to incorporate that into the game so that others could draw from it. Um, That real, what's known as a writer's table game, where it's basically everyone's able to contribute almost equal amounts of new material ideas and information that are going into the story. Um, but I also needed to something that would work in a way that there was still kind of a level of control of making sure that there isn't, you know, what I like to kind of call the, you know, application where basically if you've got something and then another player will just say, no, that's not what happened. That's not what I meant. You know, that kind of thing that it needed to be structured in a way so that, you know, if anything was created, it wasn't going to be broken or manipulated or completely twisted from what was intended. Um, And for that, I needed to be able to create something, you know, specifically that would, you know, create that effect. First and foremost, that was the main thing. I didn't want something where you were rolling dice to determine if you're going to hit or miss, I wanted something to determine, okay, so this is what you say you're going to do. Excellent. Not a problem. And now, you know, we've got this. And then what's going to happen as a result of that? You know, like what little quirk's going to go a little off or how are things going to go even better than you imagine? So something that would be a little bit more randomizing. And as I understand, as I understand it, the solution that you came to, um, is is essentially um, details, i.e. I. put i.e. putting in notes in the um, sto- in the story, or even just having it be an edit button. Um, how did you come to that conclusion? 
That was just basically um, once we realized that using kill shots mechanics wasn't going to work for us. Uh, we kind of just started free forming a little bit, uh, and what I started doing was just noticing how we were just kind of engaging with ideas at the table. And that's when I started to get the idea of what if there were, like, one of the main problems I've always found is when you have a writer's table kind of a game going, is that it's very easy for one person who's, like, super eager, hopped up on sugar and all this other kind of stuff, to just go full bore and just start going into, like, a five-minute you know, like description of what their character does and they're bouncing across five different rooms simultaneously and everything like that. And then you'll have other players who are a little bit more kind of uh, direct or specific with it. It just in 10 seconds, they've said everything that it is that they need to say. Um, so details are a way to kind of help regulate that to keep it so that everyone is contributing the same amount or at least that no one is contributing more than someone else and what it is basically is that each detail is a kind of an action or something uh, related to what you're providing uh, that either moves the action or the story forward and the total number of details that you have to work with depends on which of your character's potentials you decide to um, help kind of frame the description or basically your character's turn so if you have a potential, and they're very much framed like uh, aspects are in fate, they're very interpretive. The idea is you want to have something that can be pro and con, you know, depending on the situation. But let's say that if you're somebody who, you know, you've got a potential known as perfect balance, and you decide that you're going to have a rooftop chase. And so you would say, okay, I'm going to use my perfect balance potential. And what that does is that is listed with three details. So that's three things that the player is able to incorporate into their turn, you know, that basically, and then once they reach that third detail, they are done. It keeps them kind of from getting too far ahead of the others um, and how they can use it can go a bunch of different ways. If they want to use those details to cover a, a lot of ground, you know, as part of that chase, excellent. You know, if they want to use it too, it's like they're going to keep up chase, but now they want to take a shortcut or they're going to hop into this, you know, or they're going to, you know, try and jump to another building and try and cut them off of the past, that kind of stuff. You know, it, it gives them opportunity to embellish as much as they need or want to, but then they're limited because once they hit that last detail, their turn is now done. Move mm -hmm. to next player. Oh, yeah. And that, br that brings me to, some to something I find interesting. Um, in a lot of in a lot of games, when it comes to the idea of of the dice rolled and the and the target number, the target number is always set, regardless of how many die you're um, throwing. Whereas in your case, you've got you've you've got a um, step chart that is conveniently right on the character note sheet, um, involving the involving the difficulty to pass the difficulty to pass as well as the details you can add. Um, did it require a whole lot of testing to get that down pat? No, not really. I think it was because the range is not, you know, um, super huge or anything like that. I mean, really, in an essence, most of the difficulty numbers will pretty much range anywhere from three to nine most commonly. Mm -hmm. um, once I realized that it was more interesting to have the difficulty numbers be an odd number, um, because not only does it help determine whether or not something is effective or ineffective, um, and that's actually something that'll be important for us to actually discuss later, the difference between that versus success or failure. But what it does is that when you roll, if you roll an odd number, then the opposite player that it's affecting gets to determine a complication that comes into play. Whereas if something is ruled with an even number, then you um, get to determine what that complication is going to be. And that's whether or not something is ineffective or, or effective. And 
once I found that it was kind of like, okay, so this, if we set the difficulties as being the odd numbers, then that way it's just like, oh, you just made it, you know, but the other player gets to determine what complication is in play. Once we said that, everything just kind of seemed to work out smoothly. It's one of the benefits of, because there's no D20s that are used in the screenplay system. So when you don't have to aim as high as 20, you know, or even higher when it comes to target numbers, it, w- it was fairly simple to kind of keep all that in line. Once we realized that it was um, more interesting to have odd number difficulty numbers, everything else just kind of fell into place. Yeah. Now... When it comes to the whole, um, when it comes to the whole idea with potentials, um, what to, obviously this obviously there isn't a way to do a hard and fast rule with this kind of thing. But generally speaking, where where do you draw the line between what is what would be considered a good example of a potential and what would be considered a not as good um, example? So I like to look at it as there's three very common types of encounters or scenarios or what like that, that will occur in almost any kind of game. Um, one of that is being combat or conflict uh, in the sense of just like a physical confrontation. Um, the other one being kind of like a, a, a battle of wits or a battle of the mind kind of thing. Um, and then the third one is some kind of social encounter of some kind where you're trying to manipulate somebody else or befriend them or, or that kind of stuff. Um, if your potential doesn't seem like it would work for all three of those possibilities, then it's not a good potential. So in the case of perfectly balanced, you know, right off the bat, you could definitely see, you know, physical ways that that could be applied. You know, you can stand on one foot on the edge of a building. You don't have to worry about falling over. But if you also look at that as being something like, well, he's, also somebody who is very well-rounded in their knowledge they don't really specialize in one area of expertise they like to know a a little about a lot of different things you know they always kind of like to understand the other side of someone else's argument so in that case they have you know like a very well-balanced mind they know a little bit a lot a lot um and then in a social situation it could just be like they're always the one who's like a really good arbitrator Mm -hmm. that you know could really kind of help settle out you know discussions between people so if you've got a potential that can handle those three different types of encounters then it's a good one if it can do two of them okay just try and round it out with some of the other potentials if it's really only going to be effective at one thing like if your potential is shoot gun real good well, you know, that's, you're, you know, there's only so much you're going to be able to do with that. And that's how I, you really want to try and look at the, take a look at the bigger pictures rather than just like, well, I'm going to make sure that he's a good shooter. It's just like, okay, what makes a good shooter? You know, like when you look at snipers who are considered to be, you know, some of the best marksmen that would exist in the world, it's not just that they're a great shot. It's their ability to persevere and to endure. Some snipers, they basically have to wait hours, if not days, without moving a muscle in a harsh environment in order to be able to make that shot. Mm-hmm. So these, there, there's more than just like, you know, someone who's got a sharp eye and a quick trigger finger. There's other ways that you could look at these characters. And that's what really makes good potentials. Because otherwise, you're just kind of, restricting the character to only be one thing and you know the whole idea with any good story is to have really interesting and deep characters that can handle a bunch of different situations now that brings that brings me to um to the to the concept to the concept of um of resources um and again, and again, I much like I much like I'd I'd asked with um, potentials. Um, it's this, the I have the same question here about what makes a good or bad one, and to kind to and to go further on from that, um, where would you draw the line between what would be better suited as a potential and what would be better suited as a resource? So resources are boosts, basically. They're something that will help a character out 
um, during a very particular moment in the story. They uh, can be anything from what are known as props, which is something physical, you know, piece of weapon, piece of equipment, that kind of thing. Um, but they can also be skills and backgrounds. The whole role of a resource is that they're something that they're a bit of a specialty that in a pinch the character can turn to to give them uh, one of two possible uh, boosts. One of which is what's known as a step bonus, which is basically if you have a plus one step bonus, you can um, act as if your potential is one step higher than it's actually listed. So in that particular case, you can either increase the die value from a D8 to a D10 or a D10 to a D12, increase the difficulty, um, you know, by the next step up, or, you know, if applied correctly, you could even use it to gain additional details with. So one of the ways I like to look at it, because last time I was on your show, we were talking about superheroes. So let's talk about the superpower of someone who is, say, the Flash, someone who basically has super speed. That power can actually be more useful as a resource because it can be applied in a bunch of different ways, but it does something very specific. And if you've got super speed, you could actually use that so that you can do more details on your turn than normal. Mm -hmm. um, and you're not, it, it really doesn't matter as to what the situation may be, as long as you can find a way to say why your speed would be a factor in this you can then apply it. Um, so I, I find resources are ways where it's just like, you know, and especially too, you know, if it's the right tool for the job, you need to pick some locks. Well, obviously you need to have the lock picks for it. Um, it's because I've always been, I, I ended up being very much turned off over the years of games that your equipment defines your success rate. Um, when in a sense, I like the idea of it, you know, these are ways that these are things that you can use to help increase your odds, but they don't necessarily guarantee that anything is going to happen. Um, you know, it's almost like, it's like saying that the sword does all the work mm. when in fact the sword is going to, you know, it's going to finish the job, <laughs> but it really comes down to who's wielding the sword. To determine whether or not it's going to hit or not. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that kind with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, I know that with whenever you whenever you were um, testing whenever you were testing it, did you ha did you have situations where some players had to unlearn um, bad ha unlearn bad habits, or did the, or did that not come up all that often? It did a little bit at first, and I've played uh, various screenplay games with, you know, different people who, who had a hard time getting used to the whole idea of contributing something, um, you know, as if they were also a GM, like for their turn. That's how I've always kind of looked at it. When you're playing a screenplay game on your turn, you are the GM for that moment. Mm -hmm. Um and there have been some people that, yeah, it took them a little while to get used to it. One of the most helpful ways I found, though, was the whole concept of what's known as initiatives in the system. And the idea behind that is that if you are the one that brought something into the story, you basically have final say on what can and cannot be done with it. So if you describe your character pulling up to the scene in like, you know, this, you know, bright shining lime green metallic, you know, metallic lime green Camaro. Mm -hmm. You now have full ownership over that Camaro, where if someone comes along and says, oh, and it's got Nitro Booster on it, and it's got, you know, like gadgets like James Bond or anything, someone else wanted to try and do that. But in your eyes, this was this beat up car that was actually your grandfather's and you're trying to fix it up, but it's still broken down. It has a tendency of, you know, like leaking gas or some kind of thing like that. That's your initiative because you created that car, even if it was still rudimentary in the very beginning. And so what that means is that if someone wants to introduce something different to it, they have to basically get your thumbs up to do so. Once we started to incorporate 
that sense of ownership and it was built into the very fabric of the game. Um, then I found people were uh, a lot more inclined to start contributing to something because then they knew, okay, so if I do this, no one can come along and change this. This now becomes my thing I've incorporated. And initiatives can go so far. I mean, really, in a sense, it defines your character. I mean, you're the one that introduced your character into the story, so therefore they are your initiative. And at the same time, too, the basic fundamentals of whatever setting that you are playing in also will come with a list of initiatives that basically allows the GM to say, okay, no matter what else we do here in this world, these things are absolutes. And they cannot be changed because they are the GM's initiatives. But everything else from that point on is carte blanche. So when we had those very clearly defined boundaries of what initiatives were and what could and could not be done with them, I found there was a lot more incentive for people to start to create and contribute things. They had, they had that boundary, but at the same time, too, it was very free form. You could do a bunch of different stuff with it. Yeah. Now... With with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'd like to I'd, I'd like to de I'd like to delve into the way that you handle da way, the way that you handle damage because when you're dealing with a universal game that mean that means you're going to be dealing with a a, bun a bunch of different potential genres and subgenres and how how do you make sure that there's the right balance between between them damage can still be a threat but not too um, squishy. We're not dealing with BX era D and D here, right? Right. So, while the term damage does apply in the screenplay system, mm -hmm. really, in essence, it was more so about kind of stripping away that whole idea of damage being physical only and being something where a variety of situations you can become emotionally stressed, and that's also a form of damage. Um, you could just be mentally worn out, you know, from a complete lack of sleep, you know, for the two to three nights before, you know, and that also can end up being a form of damage. So what the screenplay system does is it has, by default, the term is stamina. Um, but depending on the genre that you're going to be playing in, that name can change. The whole principle of how it works remains the same. It's just more a uh, terminology change to fit the genre. So like with Dial M for Murder, which is like the old 1950s horror monster movie uh, hack of screenplay, in that one it's known as survival. Because that's what it's all about. It's about your survival. In High Plains Samurai, it's known as vitality. Um, because it can also be used to measure, you know, not just your overall health, but also to how vital you are to the story. Anyone with higher vitality is considered to be a more influential character in the overall story. Mm -hmm. um, and so this way, it, it's set up in a way so that you can have multiple sources of harm, damage, or you know, however you like to refer to it, that can still kind of compile and add up over time. But I also wanted to set something up so that I... I love games that make that have you make a choice to say i'm gonna burn a little extra mm -hmm. in exchange for trying to do something a little bit more than before and what you can do in the screenplay system is you can spend stamina to basically cheat a little bit <laughs> but it basically is costing you some of your hit points so say for example you roll the die and the difficulty number is five you roll a four. Ah, shit, that's not quite enough. You know what? You spend a point of stamina, and you can actually increase that die roll from a four to a five. Mm -hmm. In which case, bam, now it's going to be effective. But then on the flip side of that, too, your opponent could then also spend stamina, if they want to, to put it back down to a four. So while it you know, and in that case, while it might seem like, well, I just wasted the stamina for nothing, at the same time, too, you've also dwindled your opponent down a little bit. And that was one of the things we found was the whole sense of there would be times where someone would say, like, I don't know if I want to bother burning the stamina for it. They're just going to go ahead and put it back. But then I've had some fights where it was just like, 
fuck, I can't hit this opponent. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We're going to dwindle him down. We're going to wear down his stamina up. And then all it's going to take is just like, you know, one or two, you know, good complication rolls. And we've got this one. And sure enough, that's how it's played out. Mm. There's other things that you can do with it too. And even then, I've always encouraged GMs, you know, or just groups in general to just play around with it. If it's something that it's like, it seems like it's a worthy enough sacrifice, go for it, you know, to make it happen. And in doing so, I've seen people who have, you know, been playing with screenplay the very first time, they're just burning through stamina. Just burning through it. But then they quickly realize they have to be smart about it. So it, it's created this really kind of nice, I call it kind of like a, a gambling factor to the game of, you know, like how much do you believe in your character? How much do you believe in, you know, your ability to roll dice, your luck and all this other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and in doing so, it's like you could take physical damage, emotional damage, mental damage, and it all accumulates. It all comes out of your stamina. And then whoever it is that reduces a character's stamina to zero, that player gets to determine how that character leaves the story. If they leave it at all. Just like, nah, I'm just going to knock him out. You know, just like, nope, we're going to... That character dies. Falls off the edge of the cliff and into the mist of the rocks below. Mm -hmm. You know, so it once again can be used to kind of help determine the narrative control in that particular moment. All right, I I got you. Now um the now we've talked we've talked about we've talked about setting hacks. Um and you you already brought up one of them with dial M for murder. Yeah. Um, dial M for monster actually. Monster. Yeah. My bad my bad. But when it but when it comes to when it comes to adapting screenplay into other settings, is it relatively easy, or are there some, or have there been some subgenres that require a bit more legwork in it than others? Um, I would say the more quote unquote cinematic genres. I mean, really, screenplay just based on its title alone uh, is really meant to create you know, the, the movie going, the, the initial script writing experience, um, you know, specifically with movies in mind. Um, at the same time, too, there was a time I wanted to do a stress test of the system um, just to see, you know, what it could really do, you know, with people who are, you know, I wouldn't say trying to break it. As it stands out, they did try to break it. <laughs> But um, so I went out to uh, like a local uh, board game night. I brought this out there and I said, you know, so I'm game that let's try whatever it is that let's talk about what we want to come up with, what we want to play, and then we'll try and make it work with the system. What we ended up doing was basically a, you know, hyper futuristic kind of Star Trek like dating simulation game where different aliens were trying to pick up on other aliens, you know, as kind of like a game show style blind date kind of situation. Like the dating game, but with aliens in the 21st century. Um, so in, and other, in other words, the Kirk simulator. Exactly. And in fact, actually, there was a Captain Kirk-like character who basically these aliens were trying to woo, you know, uh, with all this other kind of stuff. And then they go on on dating sims and everything else like this and play out these scenes. So it was this really slapsticky, goofy, you know, Star Trek spoof um, where basically, you know, like one alien is trying to shag up with Captain Kirk and then, you know, another alien would come on, you know, like slap them with a tentacle or some kind of thing like this. Mm -hmm. And it did work because, you know, rather that we didn't end up focusing on, you know, on your stamina in that particular case, we just simply relied on the dice rolls to determine, you know, uh, if, you know, like if that pickup line was effective or ineffective, and then uh, who would determine what complication would come into play with this. So, you know, basically kind of the passing the baton, the game basically determined, okay, so I'm going to say that this character does this. Now let's roll to see who determines what that actually is going to end up looking like when it's all said and done. 
and it actually worked surprisingly well actually so so far i haven't really run into anything it hasn't been able to handle i mean for me the screenplay system is one that drop of a hat um i'll i'll run it I'll, you know whatever it is if someone says you know uh i i want to play um you know i i want to play a different kind of like you know supers rpgs it's just kind of like off the seat of our pants right you know i want to play like a, a deadwood game or some kind of thing like this mm -hmm. i'll default to screenplay because for me it's something where i know i can get it to handle a lot of different genre mixes um and it's also too it's just set up in a way that for me is just really easy like if anything i just need to double check to confirm maybe a little bit of terminology or something like this or you know Making because when you design a game, it's always impossible to remember which version it is that you actually published because you've done 25 different drafts of the same thing. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I haven't really, I personally have not come across anything just yet. I'm sure it's totally possible. I'm, I'm not going to be that naive and say, no, it's flawless, it's absolutely perfect, and no one dare tell me otherwise. But <clears throat> What I, with that with that kind of thing in mind, when it comes to when it comes to bringing in the supernatural elements, especially especially given that the two campaign settings that um that I was introduced to um, screenplay through, obviously one of them was High Plains Samurai, which we'll get to in a minute, but the other one huh. was a much smaller um, demonstration in the form of Ironbound. Um, when it comes to those two settings. How did how did the, how did those two come about and how and how and um what and what was your approach when it came to con when it came to introducing that idea and how it can be adapted with um well screenplay uh, the apropos that I'm using the phrase adapted with that kind of thing yeah um well like I said high plane samurai screenplay really was built uh, to handle high plane samurai um. And so that was always the goal in the long run, anyways. It's like, you know, anything that could handle this kind of wackiness, you know, that's on board. But I also wanted to, you know, I'm not even totally sure why I decided to take this route. It was, I think it was almost more of like, in order for me to see if it can handle a variety of situations, publishing it as a, as a standalone rule system made sense to me at the time. Um, so when the time came that I wanted to come up with something else to try and run it with, I had this idea for a fantasy setting um, called Ironbound, like maybe 20 years prior. Like I remember this idea as a teenager that it always just kind of stuck me. And the idea at the time was that they were holy warriors who were basically uh, fighting devil worshippers, which uh, I refer to as uh, witches and warlocks and all this other kind of stuff. That I've uh, since, you know, uh, I've had a complete reversal on opinion whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, but still, you know, like at the time, that's what I came up with. And the catch to it was is that um, they would fight dark magic by understanding it. They would study it, but they would be prohibited from actually using it. So they would understand how a ritual, a dark ritual is created the elements that you need to put it all together how spells can cast how you can summon a demon but they can never actually do it themselves but they use that knowledge to basically help counter you know magical effects and everything else like that mm -hmm. um and so it was one of those things where i'd always said to myself one of these days i'm going to actually write a screenplay for it then i realized i'm not actually an aspiring screenwriter anymore so why don't i just take it and i'll make a screenplay game out of it as a representation of the kind of things that's possible with this. So I'd say, if anything, Ironbound was really kind of being able to cross something off of a bucket list to say, there, I did something with it. <laughs> Even if it's not what I initially intended, I got it out there, slapped a logo on it, and put it in some kind of published form. All right, I, I can certainly get, I can certainly get, behi get behind that. Um, now, when it can... Now I think what I think what um what's very what's very interesting with some with something like Ironbound because of certain um bad, as I mentioned before bad habits especially given the quote unquote world's most popular role playing game 
patent pending. Mm. Um, is the idea that if that anytime anytime someone's looking at a fantasy game, that they're that they're going to be looking at classes when you were playtesting early on with some with a setting like Ironbound, did you have any players who had that assumption? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, and in fact, it was one of those things where it it just whenever I would give the elevator pitch to it, it would basically be it's D and D except you understand but cannot use magic and so you have to come up with alternative ways you know you have to use this information against your opponent but at the same time too yes one of you is the sword master or the other is the archer someone's a rogue etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm-hmm. um and and i think a lot of it is just because it's such a staple for fantasy tabletop gaming in uh, actually fantasy gaming in general it doesn't even matter the medium anymore um that whole approach of what a fantasy game is is such a staple that it, it seemed to make sense to go with something fantasy first because especially in the tabletop industry fantasy is still like the number one genre i mean so much of fantasy other than my elves look like this. My dwarves will look like this. Oh my goodness! No, I don't have halflings. Um, there are just so many kind of standard approaches and everything when it comes to fantasy. It just kind of seemed like the easiest way to kind of get people on board, and also too, it was able to give everybody kind of like a, a direct correlation of just like, okay, so how do you like my fantasy, my version of a fantasy game versus you know the world's most popular version of a fantasy role-playing game what are the differences and that kind of stuff so it's easier for people to kind of lean on something that they already understand and then just see how this one particular game takes that approach how it plays out over the course of a, of a few hours mm-hmm. and to be fair to be fair um within ironbound you do you do kind of have something close to classes in the form of the roles in the back of the book Mm -hmm. yeah and that's really more so like you know that the whole idea of calling it a rule is that it's like you know it's more of kind of like you you are going to inhabit the rule of it like each of them was more of like rather than telling you specifically how you go and do everything like you know this particular character um, always uses two-handed swords this particular character always uses blunt weapons bows no you know never uses a crossbow that kind of stuff was to really kind of give the more overall impression like if you had a a film director was actually going to sit you down and basically say this is your character this is what it is that you're contributing you know you're here as the heavy hitter you're the one who is like the studious one who stays up until like all hours of the night reading about, you know, like dark magic and all this other kind of stuff, but not get so specific that there's no room for individual interpretation. Um, and that's why I like the idea of using rules, but also too, because it leans so heavily into just the whole movie making aspect that is really just, you know, inherent in the screenplay system. Yeah. Um, now, with that kind of thing in mind, do you do you consider screenplay to be to be skewed more towards um, one shots, or do you think it or do you think it can handle long term campaigns as well? Oh, both for sure. I've done it for one shot games. I've also too. Um, I've been running a few campaigns of High Plains Samurai. I've got one campaign that's left. And we've had to basically put the epic conclusion on hold because of the pandemic. Because online gaming is very difficult for me where I live. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in-person gaming just wasn't going to fit. So we've literally had it on pause. Um, So not including the year and a half off, I'd say we've been running that one. That was going on for about 18 to 20 months. With at least one game a month kind of thing. So... You know, going into like 18, 20 sessions, at least we were running this and holding up, personally speaking, in like no issues whatsoever. Um, But at the same time, too, I've used it for quite a few one shots of just like, we got a couple hours. Okay, let's do this. Mm -hmm. Because then I know for me, it's one of those things where it's just like, 
you know, it's built in a way. Honestly speaking, the screenplay system was really me defining how I wanted to present certain games, like watching how these games were all playing out and then formulating a way to say, here's how I want to approach it in a way that I can just whip something up out of nowhere. Um, and then I've got a system that can just kind of handle it. Like I've run it so much that if I need to create a character, I can just do that in the fly in about a minute and I've got someone fully statted out ready to go. The only thing I need to watch for is just how I phrase the potential, because once again, too specific, and I'm not using it enough. Yeah. But other than other than that, yeah, I mean, like it's uh, I haven't had a problem doing one way or the other. Yeah. Now, since I since I kind of set up Chekhov's gun about to- regarding talking about um f- about about high plane samurai, I may as well um. I may as well I may as well fire that gun so so nobody thinks it's jammed or um ends up winning a Darwin award for misfires. Um with hi- what was what was the impetus to create um High Plane Samurai just when it came to the setting idea? Was it just a reflection of the films you were watching at the time or something? Uh it was really more of a dare than anything else. Like I said, I uh, had went to my regular playtesting group and they were the ones who, you know, play tested kill shot with me, you know, and they, you know, had done the due diligence and, and even then too, there were a few times where it kind of seemed like that's not really what they were looking forward to, but they were going to truck it out with me. Mm-hmm. So it was like, okay, whatever it is that you guys want to run. And it was just a mash of everything that started coming together. But one of the main influences was a um, a South Korean film, uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. Oh, I'm, um, I'm familiar with that one. Yeah, so that was one of the main things behind it. And then as we started going, it was more of like, well, couldn't we also have this with it instead? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? And then it got to the point when someone said, well, what if they had mutant abilities, like superpowers or something like that? And the more we kept throwing at it, the more we just seemed to be able to find a way to make it work. And that was kind of the whole point, is it just started to develop organically during play. And then I started fleshing things out and started creating a setting that would explain why all these different things existed and commingled, um, you know, together. And uh, yeah, so I guess it's in a sense where it's just like, I basically put it out there to the players and didn't say no to anything. (laughs) It was yes and, like the whole improv thing, it's either yes and or or no but. I was yes and to everything that they were offering. And now with that that kind of of thing in mind, I know... um, Screenplay screenplay has been has been around for a good for a good amount of time. Would it would it be fair of me to say that um, some of the things that are present in pa- in Pandora are kind are um are based on lessons that you learned from the development of screenplay? Oh, definitely, definitely. Screenplay was definitely the work where I cemented how I want to approach the game from a GM standpoint in the sense of I don't want this to be something where the GM is just along for the ride that they are um, they are there to have as much fun as the other players for the same reason you know what I mean like it's you know as the GM you're not just kind of sitting there checking off the boxes and making sure that you're hitting every single beat on time but there's room for you to be as creative during play as it is for the other players, but also to the whole idea of cementing the concept that everyone at the table is a player. Mm -hmm. One of those players is the GM, which is a specific type of player, but they are still a player versus the mentality that other, you know, people in other games may have, where it's just like there are players and then there's the GM, as if this other person who is either kind of above the role of the players, quote-unquote, or at a different level than they are, 
I've always kind of looked at that analogy as being the host of a party, but no one expects you to be able to have fun at the party either. Your job is to just keep topping up the snacks, topping up drinks, you know, making sure that everyone else is having a good time. But you yourself aren't having a good time. You're too busy in the kitchen doing dishes. Mm -hmm. Um, So screenplay was definitely when I cemented that in there. And that definitely carried over into Pandora to the point that almost every single game I do nowadays, I very clearly define who is a player. When I'm talking about players and when I'm talking about characters um, and you know, just that, that overall approach of, you know, the GM is a player. I, I think those are things, and they've definitely carried forward into Pandora and, and everything else that I've worked on since then. Um, what would you say? What would you say were some of the, um, some of the big, some of the bigger hurdles that you felt that you had to overcome when it came to the transition between um, Pandora and and um, screenplay. Well, Pandora is something that it, it does something far more specific. Um, but then once again, it still has to be open-ended to be able to handle a lot of different scenarios. But overall, it's trying to do something very, very specific. I think that was one of the biggest hurdles with screenplay. It was about finding how to be as wide open uh, and as interpretive as possible while still being structured, mm. you know? So it's just like, you know, um, thematically everything is different, but the game still plays out exactly the same way. With Pandora, it's really more so about specifically creating a scenario where the characters are in a very particular kind of situation and the kinds of problems that they run into are also very specific. Mm -hmm. Um, Pandora is also a game where player self player agency is a major part of the game in the sense of just like your character is going to go through some bad stuff, but you always have say over what those bad things are. Um, So you're never going to be forced to accept a situation that you might not be comfortable exploring. Whereas with screenplay, the whole idea was that you're in control of your character, but you're also sharing the load with others at the table. So, you know, you don't really know for sure what's going to happen when you go to roll those dice. Um, And you don't know if you're the one that gets to make the call until what that problem is going to be. So screenplay was more kind of I don't know, far more open-ended and far more cooperative with everyone at the table, whereas Pandora is more specific and also, too, far more about you having control over your own character. You know, it just... there You have to make hard decisions, but those decisions will always be within your control. If you don't want to have your character lose a limb or some kind of thing like this... Or have to, you know, if you want to go through Pandora and not have a single innocent person harmed under your watch, you do have that control. Um, But at the same time, too, then it means that you have to start seriously considering some of the other options. But the control, the control still remains with you. That's, I'd say, like the biggest differences between them. And each one had to take like its own kind of mental exercises and throwing lots of pieces of paper in the garbage or, or burning them outright sometimes. Mm-hmm. And with, with that in, with that in mind, I, I would like to, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Oh, my pleasure. Always a pleasure to be here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course... Okay. Sorry, I didn't didn't mean to cut you off. 
No worries. I was just going to say nice. Yep. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>